starting the recorder now. Um, but you know, if you just go to Godo, 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 okay, no, I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> um, it is open source, and the current version is 4.3. And you can ask, you, you can check out some of the games that are already developed using Godo, you know, and kind of check out you know, how people do it. And because it's open source, um, there's actually plenty of training material online as well. Uh, this website by itself already has uh, quite a bit of documentation, like tutorial of how to get certain things done. Um, but because it's free, a lot of people are playing with it just because you know, they can just download it. You can install it through Steam. Okay. Yeah. So check it out <laughs> when you have time. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely familiar with Steam. Yep. <laughs> I think I have like 800 games. <laughs> Yeah, no. All right. Man, it's those sales. <laughs> <laughs> but you can use Steam to sell your games too. Yeah, that's um, another huge thing. Once you get the green light, like yeah. I've looked into that process a little bit. Yeah. Like I've also talked talked to a couple of indie developers about it. Um, another thing you can also do is to join the computer science club. <laughs> uh, we have, you know, I think at least two officers for you in this class. Are you an officer, Sean? So three officers in this class. So talk to the computer science club because you know they are starting. Some people in the club are interested in uh, developing games as a club activity, you know, just with other students. Oh, okay. So you know that might be a you know kind of good way to connect with other people who want to get into game programming, just to kind of check out what they do and yeah. yeah, and get some experience with it if there are projects involved. Yep. Yep, so hook up with uh, the Computer Science Club. We are meeting this afternoon at 1.30 in this room. So we can, if you can make it, you, know, you can kind of talk to some people. I have to take my dad to an appointment. Okay, yeah. And that's my only issue. I have a lot of time constraints. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to get the start, class started. But at the end of this class, you can check out with uh, Sean you're back there. He's one of the officers. And we have two other officers in this class <laughs> of that club, so... All right, so we are getting started with, uh, well, we are continuing with the D flip flop and other basic memory devices. So do we have any questions that you guys want to ask before next Tuesday? Because next Tuesday is our exam one, and this is the last lecture for you guys to ask any questions related to exam one on next Tuesday. Yes? Would today's lecture be like all day today? Nope. Nope, that's, uh, we did that on Tuesday already, so today we are moving on unless there are specific questions that you want to ask. Uh, you can use the lab time to ask questions too, but we do have a lab activity today, so um, if you already have a question, ask now, you know, it would be good. If not, you know, if any time you guys remember, oh, there's one thing I need to ask about the exam, you know, you can always just kind of ask a question in the middle of the class. Yes? Sorry? Um, well, it is part of the lab activity, so I think you know you should probably know how to use log. For the exam? Well, since I don't have the, I have not thought of the questions yet, so I cannot tell. I really cannot tell. It's not like I don't want to tell, it's just because I don't know. That's typically something I do like over the weekend before the exam. All right, so any other questions related to exam one? Yes? Oh, yeah, sorry if you may have said this, but how much time is allotted to the day? Which day is like the uh, 80 minutes, the entire lecture period. Okay. Yep. All right, so are we good? Okay, well, if you can think of any questions, you'll just go ahead and ask me you know, when we are in the middle of the uh, lecture. But for now, we are going to. You know, just move on with the lecture. And I'm getting this weird, you know, vertical, horizontal sliding thing. You know, I thought I fixed it, you know, but apparently not. It's okay. You know, I, think I can fix that later. All right. So we are, you know, talking about D flip flops. Oh, we well, we didn't talk about D flip flops. We talked about the SR latch and also how to track down changes in the circuit. Okay. So that was what we did, 
And I think with this class, I recommended you guys to you know, experiment with tracking the changes with changing both the S and R pins from zero to one at the same time. Okay, did anyone do that? Go through that process a little bit, okay? So did you notice something special about that? I mean, I was happy to do it, honestly. Okay, all right. That's okay, not a problem. So what I'll do is I'm gonna do it today, okay? Because I want to kind of use this also as an opportunity so that you know we get another exposure of how to track down changes in the circuit like that. Okay, so we'll go to the class, go to the shared folder. Okay, so this is the shared folder which is already shared with all of you. And the spreadsheet that we were working on the other day was dated, you know, um, with the date, so that was Tuesday, which is two days ago, and was it two days ago? Yeah. It is the 26th, so did I misname the file? I might have. Uh-oh. Okay, what did I do? Modified. Look at the last one. All right, so I think this one will work too. Yeah, so this one will work. You know, it's not exactly the same file that we work on, but it's close enough. So what we, what I'm gonna do is I will duplicate your sheet one to yet another sheet. So just duplicate, and this is the the actual duplicate. And then what I'll do is I am just going to erase some portions of this. So everything from row eight and down, I am going to erase. So there we go. Get rid of all of this. Delete. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to quickly go through you know, what we did on Tuesday. No, last Thursday. Okay, so, so it was last Thursday. So it has to be the 19th one. But this one is close. Okay, this is pretty much the same thing. Um, okay, so we talked about, you know, how you know, everything starts off as unknown to begin with. And then what we do is we change the two input pins to all zeros. And then the NC row, you know, NC in this case stands for node connectivity. In other words, based on the wiring of the circuit, what is going to change because the input pins got changed into zero and zero. And then on row one, we have the uh, node number. So everything that shares the same number belong to the same node. So the input pin S, the, imp the first input pin of N1, which is a NAND gate, they share the same node. In other words, if this changes, this will also automatically change because of how they are wired. So is that okay? Does everybody at least remember that part? Because it hasn't been a week, okay? So unless you actually spend some time to review and kind of practice the material, it's easy to kind of forget the, uh, the this content. So my recommendation of you know, from last Thursday, last Thursday was okay. Let's do another NC here, okay? Based on you know, what is already the current state, and this time we are changing both R and uh, S and R both to ones at the same time. And you know, we want to see what happens, okay? Because we have already experimented with changing um, either the S or R one pin at a time, and we can go like, kind of like, okay, we kind of get you know, what, how that works. But this one is kind of interesting, so we'll see what, what this is going to do. So the first thing we need to do, because it's an NC row, is to follow node connectivity and update every other node that is either connected to uh, node zero or node one. This is a connected node to node zero. And, oops, I pressed the wrong key. I am going to use my other keyboard because you know, this keyboard, you know, I'm not used to the layout. I'm much better with this one. Yeah, if I cannot type, blame the keyboard, right? Well, I, I know a few gamers who do that. <laughs> I lost the game because you know, this is not the keyboard that I'm used to. Okay, so this connects to node one, so all of these are updated to ones. So I'll be good with row eight, okay? 
So we update everything that are on node zero or on node one. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so now we're on the next row. You know, what is this row going to be? Between, how do I label this particular cell? Um, PD. PD, yep, it is after a propagational delay, we want to figure out what is going to be changed. In other words, from the previous row, which is row eight, we want to find out which input pin, okay, or which component has at least one of its input pins changed. So we got both, you know, N, uh, N1 and N2, they both got at least one input pin changed. So for N1, um, input pin zero, which is the first input pin, changed from a zero to a one. So we should probably try to figure out whether the output is gonna change as a result of that. So we'll go ahead and do that. We we'll just put a cursor here, and you guys can tell me whether output the output of N1 should be changed. It is currently a one, the output, but because of the change to to the input pin, should I change the output pin at this point? This is a NAND gate. So tell me what are the inputs to NAND gate N1 at this point. The output should be a zero because both inputs are ones. That is correct. And because the zero is not you know, the same as a one, it is a change, so we put a zero here. Now we move on to N2. N2 also needs to be analyzed because in the previous row, you know, input two, or input one, which is the second input of N2, changed from a zero to a one. So what do we put here? Another zero, very good, okay, so because you know, this row is not empty, the PD row is not empty, we are not at a steady state. So if we are not at a steady state, we have to alternate between NC and PD. So the next one is gonna be NC, which is basically looking at node two, okay? And say, okay, everybody who connects to node two now need to change to a zero. So that means this needs to change to a zero, this also need to change to a zero. But wait, there's another output pin that changed in the previous NC uh, PD row, which is this one. So everything that connects to node three also need to be changed to a zero. So that would be this one and this one over here. Because the NC row is not empty, now we have to go for another PD again. So with this PD, we do the same analysis, which is looking at the previous row, which is row 10 this time, and ask, did that change, you know, the input of at least one input of a device, okay? We only got two devices here. We have N1, which is a NAND gate, and N2, which is also a NAND gate. So what is the answer? Did we change at least one of the inputs of N1? Yes. We did, okay, so we might need to double check and make sure that this uh, the, out, the, the output that was zero stays as zero, because if it's changed, we need to make a change here. What do you think? Do we need to make do we make a do we need to make a change here? Okay, we need to change it to a one because at least one input of the NAND gate N one is a zero, so that means the output needs to be a one at this point. The same argument can also be applied to N two because one of the input of N two just got changed because of this cell, so that means it changed it changed to a zero, so the output has to be a one here but a one is a change from what it was before, which is a zero, so it is also changed to a one here. Are we good so far? All right, so we are not at a steady state because the PD row is not empty, okay? You know, something got changed. So that means the next row is gonna be another NC, okay? So we have another NC row here, and then this time we look at what changed in the previous row and look at the node number, and then we go, okay, everything that connects to node two are now ones, okay? So there's this guy and also this guy over here. But also, because you know, node three also got changed to from a zero to a one, so that means everything that connects to node three also need to change to a zero from a zero to a one. So there's one here and there's also one here. <laughs> so now, yeah, you, 
it's good. You, you already noticed that, that we have a loop here. So now we have another PD, and the PD says, okay, it looks like uh, N1 has one of its input pins changed from a zero to a one. So now we have one, one as input to N1, so the output is going to be a zero. And then the same thing is uh, also applicable to N2, because N2 has its first input pin changed from a zero to a one, and now N2 has both input pins being one and one, which means the output becomes a zero again. Okay. So what you might notice is this row, okay, this PD row is identical to this particular PD row here, which means now we have a loop because we are in the very same condition as we were you know, represented by row nine. So row nine and row 13 are exactly the same, which means the following rows would also be the same so that means we are going to be staying in this non-steady state, or we can call it oscillation, forever. Okay, so I hope you know. Besides, you know, you know, this student here, that most people have a chance to at least give this a try, because you know this is kind of like an exercise. Okay, you know, this is basically studying. You know, all the things that I recommend you do, recommend you to do, are basically ways to study for this class. All right, so are we good with this analysis? Does everybody kind of understand that this whole, this circuit is just going to alternate both output pins between zeros and ones forever? Okay, so you can turn a at all latch into what we call an oscillator because it just flips you know, between zero and one all the time. All right, are we good so far? Do we have any questions about? how I track changes using a spreadsheet or, you know, the behavior of, you know, the NAND gates in this particular case in the circuit. Now, this circuit is surprisingly simple. All it has are two NAND gates. It is the connection, the cross connection between the NAND gates that turn it into, quote, unquote, a memory device. All right, so with this done, we are going to continue with the <clears throat> the lecture because we are moving on to the next device. So the next device is called a D flip-flop. The D stands for data, okay? So a D flip-flop is basically um, a data storing device, okay? And the circuit is a little bit more complex and you can see that you know, in order to implement a D flip-flop, we are going to make use of the SR latch that we just you know, analyzed you know, right before this whole discussion. So I'm gonna create the circuit in Logisim just so that you have a kind of more visual view of the circuit. And then we will go ahead and maybe do an analysis of this circuit too. So let me go to a command line interface, start up Logisim. And let me move it to this window. There we go. And I'm not sure whether I have that circuit already saved. Probably not. It's okay. We can rebuild everything from scratch. How about that? Let's do that. Okay, this is going to be a fun project. Okay, so this one is um, a typical NAND gate. So I'm going to change the design a little bit, you know, just so that it will fit what we need to do a little bit better. So I'm taking out the multi-bit you know, input and output pins. And instead, I'm just going to have single bit input and output here. Okay, so let me close this up. I think this is good. this is a good exercise because it really shows you how you know all the discussion connect in this class. There we go. So now we have our NAND gate. So I'm going to go to the circuit here and change the name to. NAND, and I'm also going to change the, go to the uh, appearance here, you know, just to emphasize this is our NAND gate. So we just put a label here, this is our NAND2 gate, because without this, it's, it's going to be a little hard to find out, you know, what a, what a chip is, okay, so this way it is labeled. All right, so now we go to the circuit, and then this time we want to implement an SR latch, which is something that we have done already. 
So I'll do this one rather quickly. It will need two NAND gates. And yes, we do have NAND gates you know, from over here. Okay, so if you go to gates, you know, we do have NAND gates over here. But I want to do my use my own NAND gate just to illustrate how everything is connected in this class. So with this one, I am trying to implement a SR latch. So the SR latch needs uh, two input pins also. Okay, so here's one, and we'll call this S, and then here's the other one. Oops, okay, forgot to press enter first. So let me go back here. This is input pin S, and this is input pin R. Oops, okay. I blame the keyboard. The position of the backslash and the enter key is off a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> But most of you do not really care about the backslash key. You only care about you know, A, S, D, and W. <laughs> and if you play the League of League of Legends, you also care about your know, Q, W, E, R. <laughs> it's a. I think it's more of a social thing, you know, with uh, League of Legends. That's never really been a deal with us. <laughs> because if your team is good, it doesn't matter how badly you suck. That's true. That's <laughs> a lot of games, right? You can have you know, the, the other four people carry you the whole way. Mm, I used to carry my friends in Halo. <laughs> Back in LAN parties, that was always fun. Yeah, LAN party is not a, such a big thing these days anymore because everything is in the cloud. Nah. It's like, what happens to such big games? Here, go to here, and then this one goes. So as I'm constructing the circuit, you guys should probably you know, you know, kind of at least oh okay that's the wrong connection. So we tie this one to this pin over here. All right. So this is our SR latch. Okay, it is the same as the SR latch that we saw the other day. The only difference is the NAND gate is not coming from the gate category. This is my own NAND gate that I implemented using two P and two anti transistors. Is that okay? But functionally, it is still the same, okay? So let's check it out. So the reason why um, there's an E here, okay, so that's not good. So let me double check and make sure my circuit is not incorrect. Two input pins, this one is E. Why is it E? Okay. All right, so let's debug this 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 design. Oh, because you know, everything started off as unknown. So let me reset the simulation and see <coughs> if nope, that's not changing it. Huh. Okay. Let's double check. This is E. That's also E. Did I make a mistake somewhere? All right. So I have to go back and check my, on my NAND circuit first. So here's my actual NAND circuit. And I want to double check that my NAND circuit is working. Nope. Let me do it. Correct. Hmm. All right, so I mean, I have to try to debug this. Give me a second. So I'm going to pull one of these and just to test whether it works by itself or not. Okay. Okay, that works. All right. Okay, so let me try to fix this. Delete. 
going to read it. Doesn't like that. So let me see if I can debug this first and just have this also come up to here. All right, so that works. So undo that. And it doesn't work. All right, so I'm going to have to switch it back to the NAND gate. I will I will debug this here later. So I'm switching from the my own NAND gate you know, back to the actual NAND gate. So get rid of that. So this one come up to here. And then this pin. that, get rid of this, get rid of that, and get rid of this. Okay, well this way works. All right, let me get rid of this part. So this is our SR latch. So with the SR latch, let me change the appearance. So this way, you know, I remember this is our SR latch. And all I really need is to remember which one is the S, which one is the R, the Q, and also the NQ. All right. So now that we have the SR latch, we can now create the D flip-flop that we were just talking about. So we go to here at the new circuit. This is D flip flop. I'm just going to use DFF to represent D flip flop. So now we are going to design this one. So when we go back to the notes here, we know that we have two input pins. One is called D, which is the data. One is EN, which is enable. It also has two output pins, which is Q and NQ. And we have two uh, NAND gate, two NAND two gates and one um, negation gate. Okay, so that's those are the components. So I'm going to go back to the circuit, pull a SR latch, and then we are going to go to gates because we need two additional NAND gates. So we're gonna pull one here, change it to narrow, reduce the number of inputs to two, duplicate this. We also need a regular NOT gate. So this is a NOT gate. We need two input pins, so one, two, two output pins, one, two. All right, so we have all the components already. We'll go ahead and change the name of these. This is D, and this is EN. Um, this is the SR latch, we'll, call, we'll just call this SR, that's the SR latch. And the two NAND gates also have names, uh, N1, N2 again. So this is N1, and this one is N2. And then the output pins are also named Q and NQ. So Q is typically the actual output of a device. NQ is the negation of Q. That's basically what it is. All right. So we have all the components, they're all named, except for this one, you know, let's go ahead and name this too. This is just N, which stands for negation gate, or just not. All right, so now we need to determine how things are connected. So D is connected to the first input of N1, which is connected to uh, the negation gate of N, okay? 
So I'm going to move things around a little bit because D is here and I need N1 to be, yep, N1 being here is good. And I need N2 to be, eh, let's put it here. All right, so we have um, D connected to the first input pin of N1. It also connects to the input pin of the negation gate. So that's node, that's one node. The second node connects from the EN, which is one of the input pins, to the second input pin of N1, but also to the first input pin of the second NAND2 gate. So here's the second NAND2 gate. We'll just dash it up maybe around here. So EN goes to the second input of N1. So we'll go ahead and make that connection right here. And it also connects to the second input pin of N2, like that. So now we go to the third node. The third node takes the output of the negation gate and connects it to the second input pin of N2. So I was wrong. This is not, I mean, it doesn't really matter all that much, but I'm going to make this the same consistent with the, uh, with the node here. And then this output goes to the second pin of N2. All right, so now we just have a few more pins to connect. Um, N1, the output of N1 goes to the S pin of the SR latch. So that means this goes to this pin over here. And then N2, the output of N2 connects to the R pin of the SR latch. So we go here and here. And then finally, the output Q of, N, of the SR latch connects to the Q pin. So this one just goes straight to here. And then this one goes to the, oops, this one goes to the other output pin, which is that here. There we go. Okay. So the error is actually correct at this point because look at the input pins of the SR latch. What are the states of the uh, inputs to, of the SR latch? Hmm? Are they ones or are they zeros? Tech, you know, it doesn't show any numbers. How are we supposed to tell you know, they are ones because they are bright green, okay? Bright green is one, dark green is zero, okay? So because both of these are bright green, which means they are ones. So you, the truth table of an SR latch, do you remember the description of Q and NQ when both input pins are one? Go ahead. Not zeros. Okay, let me. Nope, they're not ones. They're NC, exactly. But NC does not mean node connectivity in that context. What does NC represent in the truth table of an SR latch? No change. No change. Very good. No change. Okay. No change from what? Right. You know, that's the question. No change from what? We don't know because we never initialize the state of this SR latch when we construct the circuit, okay? So that means, you know, we are telling the SR latch to maintain its current state, but we never initialize the state of the SR latch. That is the reason why the outputs are both error, because we don't know what they are, because we never told this particular SR latch how to initialize. Is that okay? So this is perfectly normal. So the whole thing, the whole point of the D flip-flop is it is easy to interface with. In other words, you can say, hey, D flip-flop, I want you to remember um, the state of one. Or I can tell the you know, D flip-flop, I want you to remember the state of zero, okay? So it all has to do with these two pins, okay? The D pin is the data that you want the entire device to remember. So ideally speaking, if, if, if the state is remembered, the state of the input pin D should be the same as the state of the Q pin, all right? But now you can see how I can flip the D pin all day long and nothing happens to the Q or the NQ pin because the EN pin is a zero. When the EN pin is a zero, the device is disabled, which means it doesn't pay any attention to the D pin at all. 
it is only when you say, okay, let's enable the device, okay? And as soon as you do that, whatever the D pin is, is going to be mirrored to the Q pin, and whatever the Q pin has, the end Q is going to be the opposite of that. So I can do it right now. You can see how, you know, now it is actually quote unquote working because it is enabled. But as soon as I turn off the enable, I can flip the D pin all I want and it doesn't change the actual state of the device. So do we have any questions about just overall, you know, how a D flip-flop works? This is also called a level sensitive D flip-flop because the enable pin, EN, is level sensitive. When EN is a zero, the device is off, and you know, the input pin D is not reflected to the Q pin. On the other hand, when the EN pin, EN pin is a one, then the device is on, which means whatever D pin is, is now mirrored to the Q pin over here. So are we good so far? Yes or no? Okay. So this is a D flip flop, which is one of the, uh, you know, above the SR latch. This is the, one of the easiest device to remember just one bit, okay? And you, all you have to do is to tell it whether it should remember whatever the D pin is, because that's the job of the EM pin. And then once the EM pin is a one, then you just specify, oh, I want you to remember a one, or I want you to remember a zero. Is that okay? All right. The analysis of this circuit is about the same as the other one, except it has more nodes. So let's count the number of nodes in this particular circuit. It is a little more, okay? So it is a little bit more complex to track down the changes. So we have one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are seven nodes in this particular circuit. So that means you know, the uh, the width of the table is going to be a little bit more, okay? And there are a lot more columns you know, because, you know, the number of columns is basically the number of connection points of the entire circuit. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So there are 14 columns to this particular design and seven you know, nodes. So the way we track down the changes is the same, okay? <clears throat> is that okay? So one thing that you might want to do is really just to do whatever I did earlier. You know, instead of you know, making the circuit in Logisim and clicking the input pins, do it in the spreadsheet way, okay? Um, it will take you a little bit more time because of the complexity of the circuit, but you know, I. You know, it is going to be helpful for you to understand you know, how things work in this case. All right, so this is another circuit. The next one, if you go back to the notes here, so there, there's a text description of how the next one works. So the next one is called an edge-sensitive um, edge deep flip-flop. The previous one is called a level-sensitive. This one is called edge-sensitive. So let's go ahead and create a circuit first. Okay, this one is kind of, uh, even more complicated because it has two SR latches, a three pin NAND gate, a two pin NAND gate, two inputs and one output. Okay, so this one is a little bit more complex, but we'll go ahead and make it. All right, so going back to Logisim, we go to project, we add a new circuit. This one is called edge sensitive, you know, D flip flop. So we're gonna call it ESDFF. And now we put all the symbols in, we put all the parts into you know, this whole thing. We have two SR latches this time. The first SR latch is called S, and then the second SR latch is called C. And we go back here, we have two NAND gates. N1 has three input pins, N2 has two input pins. So now we go to the logic gates again, pull out the NAND gate, both of those can be narrow. Uh, one has three input pins. The one with three input pins is N1. And then we duplicate it. This one is N2, which only has two input pins. There we go. So we are now down to the input pins and the output pins. 
two input pins. One is CLK, which stands for clock. Okay. The other one is data, which is you know just you know the same as D. So we have one input pin. We call this clock CLK, and then we have another input pin. This one we call data. You can use just D also because it serves the same purpose as the D pin of the previous circuit. And then as far as output pins are concerned, we only have one, which is our Q pin over here. So N, Q can be a part of the output, but at this point, okay, the Q pin is not useful at all, or excuse me, the N, Q pin, the negation of Q is usually not useful, so we don't even bring it out to an output pin. All right, so now we want to look at the connectivity between all of this, and we want it to look at least somewhat nice, okay? So I will start with um, C dot Q, you know, the Q output of the C SR latch connects to the output pin Q. Okay, that's what you know, the last node is trying to specify. So that means, you know, if I want the circuit to look nice, you know, this is probably one thing I can do, okay, is to place these two components closer to each other. And then the second one, you know, so now I want to see what goes into the SR latch C. So what goes into the SR latch C1 is coming, so it's specified here. So the output of N1, you know, goes to C dot R as well as N2 dot N0. So that means I'm going to rearrange things a little bit here. And then we just go like this. It goes to C dot R. N1 dot output goes to C dot R. Okay, so C dot R is the one down here. And then we also have the same thing going to N2 dot N0. So this is N2. And 0 is the first input pin or the top input pin. So we also have a circuit like this. So that's another node. I haven't done this one yet, so let's do this one. This one says you know, the NQ output of S is going to the first input of N1 as well as C dot S. Okay, this is the NQ output of S. Okay. So this is the NQ output of S. It goes to the S input of the SR latch C. And then it also goes to the first input of N1. So this is going to the first input of N1, which is here. So I can see how this is going to be pretty ugly. All right. So the output of N2 goes to the third input of N1. OK, so we'll do it one at a time. Oh, I can. There we go. <laughs> um, it also goes to S dot S. So this, what are we looking at? The output of N2, it goes to S dot S, which is here. Okay. There we go. And now we have the, the data pin or the clock pin going to the R input of the SR latch S. So clock goes to the R here. It also goes to the middle input pin of N1. The middle pin of N1 is right here. Ooh, okay, accidentally that aligns. And then we have C dot Q, oh, sorry, we are back to the first one. The data input pin goes to the second one of the N2. So this goes to the second input pin of N2, which is right here. All right, I have no idea whether I got the circuit right or not, but I can test it. So the way this one works is a little bit different from the first one. So the data pin is still trying to represent what do we want the device to remember. Okay, so if it's a zero, that means I want to change the output pin Q to a zero. If it is a one, that means I want the, uh, the output pin Q to be a one. 
Okay. So that pin, the data pin is still you're trying to specify what state do I want this Z flip flop to remember. So once again, if I go to the data pin and just change its state, I can do this all day long and nothing is happening to the Q output of the C as all latch. But the way this one works is it is not level sensitive, which means I it is edge sensitive, and I, if I remember correctly, this one is rising edge sensitive. So that means when I change the state of the clock pin, now it works. It's at the very moment when the clock pin changes from zero to one, it is only at that moment that it will capture the state of the data pin and mirror that to the queue. Is that okay? So that means right now, because I'm not at a transition anymore, I can go to the data pin again and flip it all day long and nothing is gonna happen to the output. Now I change the data pin to a zero. If I change the clock pin from a one to a zero, nothing is still gonna happen because only the rising edge is important. A rising edge means we're going from zero to one. A falling edge means we're going from one back to zero. Are we good so far? Okay. So let's, let me double check, okay? Because the input or the data pin is now a zero. The output pin is still a one because that's what I asked you to remember earlier. But if I change the clock pin from a one back to a zero, you can see nothing happens to the output pin. But when I change again from zero back into a one, it remembers. So this is why, it is, this, is why this particular circuit is called a edge sensitive input clock because it is only when we have an edge, okay, particularly a rising edge in this case, that the device will remember, it will, it will remember the data pin state as the state of the overall. Do we have, yeah, go ahead. I think there's a uh, data point, I have to change the fly, so it's going to be different. Not change the fly. state of the data pin is mirrored to the state of the entire device, which is also the queue pin, at the moment when the clock pin goes from zero to one. So that would be the best way to describe how to explain the data pin. But you can also kind of see the analysis of this circuit is going to be even more complex than the level sensitive D flip flop, because this one is edge sensitive. So, you know, I'm going to, depending on how much time we have today, I can go over, you know, the, you know, um, track, the change tracking, you know, of this particular circuit. But right now, I think most of you are having this question of, okay, I can kind of see how the SR latch is a little bit too primitive to be useful, okay? Because, you know, when the both input pins are one ones, then it is maintaining its state. It is saying, okay, no change to the output. But there are two flip-flops now, okay? The one, the first D flip-flop that we constructed, which is the edge, uh, the level sensitive D flip-flop, which is also just called a D flip-flop. This one is uh, depend dependent on whether the EM pin is a one or not. When the EM pin is a one, then whatever the data pin is, the Q pin will mirror. With the edge sensitive D flip-flop, the only time the output pin is gonna change is when we have a rising edge with a clock pin. So other otherwise, the data pin can change all I want, but nothing is gonna happen to this Q pin. It is only when the clock goes from zero to one, which is right now, that the uh, state of the data pin is mirrored. So now the question is, why? Why do we have you know, stuff like this? Well, because one controls the timing, the other one controls who is paying attention. So let me say that one more time. The mechanism of the regular D flip flop, this enable pin, is kind of like, just imagine that you have a whole bunch of Ds, okay? They are all listening to the same data. So this is a mechanism where you can say, it's kind of like you know, me talking, okay? You know, me talking to the whole class and imagine each and every single one of you is a D flip flop, okay? So if I say one, okay? Then I have to kind of tell, okay, who should remember this? Okay, let's say you should remember this, okay? 
So you are the only difference of with the enable being a one, the rest of the class would have to be uh, enable team being a zero. So they are not even paying attention to me, even though you know I'm you're talking in my class. So this particular circuit has the mechanism of specifying who should pay attention to the data thing. Is that okay? The other circuit, which is the edge sensitive D flip flop, controls the timing. The clock pin controls the timing. So I can be doing all kinds of stuff, okay, and changing the data pin, you know, from zero to one all day long, okay? But I'm not telling this circuit to pay attention until the clock pin goes from zero to one. Exactly at that moment, this, this, this particular default flop will remember the state. So you can look at this one and just kind of imagine that you're in an orchestra, okay? So and let's say I'm the conductor, okay? So when I, do, you know, kind of, wave the wind, okay? I'm providing the timing for the entire you know, orchestra. All right? So one controls the timing, the other one controls who should be paying attention. So it would sound like both of these are important. Excuse me, that's a, uh, let me mute my phone. That's one of the messages that can actually go through my do not disturb. But I'm pretty sure nothing is Nothing important is happening. That's my daughter. But even if something important is happening, she's in Irvine right now. There's not much I can do about it. So I'm gonna wait until the end of the class to find out what is, what's happening. Um, right, okay. So now the next circuit, okay, which I am not going to actually draw anymore because it is a lot more complex, is the combination of these two. So the next one is called a clock and gated. Gated means it is level sensitive. So this particular circuit is going to have three input pins, and you can see how it has a data input pin as usual. Okay, the data input pin is basically just specifying should I remember a zero or should I remember a one. It has an EN as well as a clock. The output is a simple Q, which means okay, this is what I remember. This is my current state. So this is a combination of the two circuits that we have talked about so far, it is both level sensitive, having an, 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 having an enable, but it's also edge sensitive, having a clock. So what does that mean? That means the only time the data input is reflected to the state of the entire device, which is also the output queue, is when the enable is one and the clock is experiencing a zero to one transition. Okay? So that means, you know, I can be the conductor, okay, providing the timing, but until I point to the violin, okay, a particular violin player, that instrument does not even play. But when it does play, you know, then when I wave the wine, that controls when that particular flip flop is gonna update. So with this device, I have control over which D flip flop is paying attention and also when it updates. Is that okay? So both of these are important. But you can probably tell that this is not the end <laughs> because now we also have one extra input pin. Okay, comparing this one to the previous one, which one is the extra input pin introduced only in this version? Reset, very good, okay? The reset pin is important because when you first power up a computer or anything that has a D flip flop and, or an S armor, the initial state is unknown. Just like you know, in Logitim, remember how when I built the, the circuit, the output of the S armor are all red because there's no initial state. The same thing happens when you turn on your computer, your phone, your, your fitness watch, they're all electronic devices. So when you first power up the device, all the D flip-flops have unknown states. Okay, so what, what do you do? Well, you should reset, okay? So when you assert the reset, then the whole device will end up in a known state. So let's check out what this reset pin is going to do. What happens when the reset pin is a zero in this case? So if the reset pin is a zero, it goes to this particular 
AND gate. This is a regular AND gate. So what happens to an AND gate when at least one input is a zero? The output becomes a zero. Okay, it becomes a zero. The zero goes to the R over here. The same zero is also going to this negation, which then goes into an OR gate. When you negate a zero, you get a one. And when at least one input of an OR gate is a one, what is the output of the OR gate? It is a one. So that means if the reset pin is a zero, then both of the output of the OR gate and the AND gate over here are determined. One is a one, okay, the OR gate would output a one, the AND gate would output a zero. Can someone tell me what is the output of this SR latch when the S pin is a one and the R pin is a zero? You can just quickly look up the, uh, the truth table. If you think of the module, if you're on this module, you just have to scroll all the way back down to um, S is one, R is two. So what happens to the two pin? The two pin is a zero, that is correct, okay? So that means by changing this reset pin to a zero, I guarantee the output is going to be a zero. That is what reset does, okay? It does not depend on anything else. In other words, these pins can still be unknown, okay? Whatever they can be. But as soon as I you know, change the reset pin to a zero from whatever it was, okay, the output is guaranteed to be a zero. This is actually what happens to your processor, to the you know, uh, memory modules you know, of your computer. There's one single global reset to the entire circuit board. And that reset is triggered by what we call a watchdog circuit or watchdog chip, which you know, automatically you know, asserts reset when you're powering up and also when power is fluctuating because you know, and it will also assert the reset for a relatively long period of time, like you know, hundreds of milliseconds, because that will guarantee every single device on your computer that has a reset pin will be properly reset. Is that okay? All right. But then this is also not the final you know, result of this entire module. The final result of this entire module Look like this. Okay, let me zoom out just a little bit so that we can see the entire circuit. And scroll. Okay, let, me, let me try to scroll using this scroll wheel. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. So each one of these is a. Okay, so let's try to call each one of these with this name. It is a resettable edge sensitive. And edge sensitive because of the clock level sensitive input clock. So every single one of these, we have eight of these, right? So how are they connected? Let's let's check out the clock line first. Okay, I'm just going to go in this order. So you can see how the clock line here is fed to every single one of these in a what I call a multi-drop topology. So they are basically all of these devices share the same clock. If the clock goes from zero to one, all eight input clocks will update at the same time as long as the enable is a one. Is that okay? So the timing of all eight foot D foot flops are shared. The data pin, okay, over here is an eight bit data pin. It is using a split I use a splitter to split it eight ways. Bit zero goes to this D flip flop. Bit one goes to this D flip flop. Bit two goes to the next one, and so on. Bit seven goes to the very last D flip flop. So that means you know, the only pin of these D flip flops that is that is not shared is the data pin. Okay, from the multi bit input data pin to the individual data pin of each D flip flop. They, are, they have a one-to-one -one correspondence. In short, each of these D flip-flops is responsible to remember one of the eight bits of the input. 
Is that okay? Okay, all right. So moving on to the enable pin, and you can see how the enable pin is also multi-drop, which means the one single enable input pin connects to the in individual input pins of all eight uh, D flip flops. So if they're enabled, they're enabled at the same time. If they see the edge from zero to one, they also see the edge from zero to one at the same time. The reset pin, same way, you know, if I you know, want to reset, all eight individual D flip flops are reset at the same time. So are we good so far? So in, from many perspectives, this is the multi-bit version of a quote-unquote D flip flop that is both edge sensitive, which controls the timing, and level sensitive, which, con which controls, hey, who's paying attention, okay? And then the output of each individual D flip flop, so each D flip flop is responsible for one bit of the output. The first D flip flop is only responsible for bit zero of the output. The second D flip flop is only responsible for bit one of the output, blah, 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 all the way to the last D flip flop, where the output is only responsible for bit seven of the output. But you probably expect that already, okay? Because this entire device is just a multi-bit D flip flop. It remembers eight bits at a time. Is that okay? So why do you think I choose eight instead of seven or six or three? There are eight bits in a byte, in brackets. So basically this is what we call a register. So this entire device is called a register. A multi-bit D flip flop has a special name called a register. It is the most elemental device inside a processor that is capable of remembering something. Do we have any questions about this whole thing? So this becomes the most elemental or fundamental memory device inside the processor. This is not memory, okay? This is a register inside the processor. It is capable of remembering, in this case, anything from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So is that okay? All right. So let's go check out you know, what we can do with a register. You have seen that already in the circuit tester you know, that we have used you know, in the past. So I'm going to build a circuit you know, with a register. And this time, I'm not going to use my own register because it's going to take a lot of time to create my own register. I'm just going to use one of the registers that LogiSim has. So let's go to circuit again. This time, we build a circuit called a counter. And to make a counter, we go to memory because the register is part of memory. You can see it has D flip flops and so on and so forth. These are not the same as the D flip flops that we talked about. Okay, so just want to tell people that is the case. And it also has a register. So when we go to nope, random generator shift register. Oh, there we go. Just a regular register. So this is a regular register. Um, you can see it has a whole bunch of pins. So let's check out all the pins. It has a D pin and a Q pin. Does that surprise you? I hope not. <laughs> because we just talked about the data pin or the D pin is when where data comes in. And the Q, which is the output of a register, is reflecting the state of the register itself. Okay, The value of the register is always presented in the Q output pin. This pin here is the enable pin, EN. Does that surprise you? Nope, because you know, we just talked about the you know, level sensitive D flip flop. This is basically saying, should the device pay attention or not? The clock pin on the other hand looks kind of ugly. This is the clock pin. It is a tiny little wedge or triangle, but it is the clock pin. When this clock pin goes from 0 to 1, or when it experiences a transition, whether it's 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, it's configurable. I'll show you in just a little bit. But that's our clock pin, CLK. And then finally, we have this 0 pin here, which is the reset pin. It is also called the clear pin, but it does the same thing. The polarity is different. 
in this case, you know, it is resetting the register to zero, zero when this pin has a one instead of a zero. So the polarity is just opposite. All right, so we are not really surprised by all the pins surrounding the register. So we're gonna go build a little circuit here that is a, what we call a counter. So we go to get a adder. Okay, so we go get the adder here. And then we connect the output of the adder like so. And then we connect we connect the output of the register to one of the inputs of the adder. And then we say, okay, let's go ahead and add zero or add one to whatever the input is. So now we need to go to wiring to get some constant. Let's see, constant is right here. Okay. So there are a few ways to do this. You know, you can specify a constant of zero, but it's a bit wide. <clears throat> Actually, I want one. So this is a constant of one that is connected to the second input of the adder. But we also want to, in this case, specify a zero as a constant to connect to what we call carry in. All right, so let's go ahead and check out you know, the adder here. This C in, or the carry input, that's our K zero. When we talk about binary addition and subtraction, remember, you know, I emphasized a few times that K0 is usually zero, but it can be a one or a zero, it can be an input. This is exactly what it means, okay? Because the chip or the component that specifies an adder allows you to specify what K0, how K0 should be connected. In this case, we're connecting it to a constant of zero, which is consistent with what we do in our class. The output, which is also called the sum bits in binary addition, is going back to the input of the register. Okay, so right at this moment, okay, some people may be expecting the register to automatically go from zero to zero to zero one and so on and so forth. Why is that not happening? Okay, if I use the poking tool, we can see the adder is working fine, okay? This wire is having all zeros because you know, the register is all zeros, but the output of the adder is already at one because zero plus one is one. So how come the register is not changing to zero one and keep changing automatically by itself? It's not enabled and there's no edge, okay? So we'll go ahead and play with those you know, particular pins. So I'm gonna make a bunch of input pins, okay? So I'm gonna have one input pin to connect to the enable. We're gonna have another input pin to connect to the clock, which is, you know, the clock pin is, look, it looks a little weird. It, is a, it, look like, it looks like a triangle. And then we'll have yet another one to connect to the reset or clear, like so, okay? So at this point, nothing happens because it is not enabled and we are not seeing an, a rising edge. Well, okay, I take it back. If it's not enabled, it's not gonna do a single thing, okay? Because I can make the clock pin go you know, from zero to one all day long. Nothing happens because it is not even enabled. Are we good so far? So the very first thing we need to do is one, make sure the clear pin is a zero and not a one because the polarity of this clear pin is when you have a one as a clear pin, then it will actually actively reset the register to zero, zero. Let's think of analogies. The clear pin is the parking brake. Okay, if you wanna drive your car, you have to make sure your parking brake is not engaged. Does that make sense? And I know somebody's gonna argue and go like, but I have driven my car you know, miles and miles, even with the parking brake on. Yeah, but that's not good for your car. Okay, so you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> because at the very first traffic stop, you're gonna smell something because the brake pad is gonna burn and mm -hmm. it's a very distinct smell. You will definitely recognize it. All right, so using that analogy, so we have to make sure the parking brake is off, okay? The enable, it's more like the ignition of your car. 
I also know that somebody's going to argue and go like, I don't have an ignition switch because I have a keyless ignition. Okay, yes, smart ass, isn't it? <laughs> but, but this is your ignition, okay? In order to drive your car, your ignition cannot be in the off position or the first or even the second. It has to be in the second position because otherwise you just have all your peripherals still turned on, but the engine is not going to run, okay? So the enable pin is kind of like an ignition. So the clock pin is the timing, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the enable, and this is the clock pin, which is the enable. So driving is not a good example in this case. Think of a camera, okay? If you think about the camera, the enable pin is kind of like the on-off switch of the camera, the, like the old-fashioned camera with, with an on-off switch. The clock pin is the shutter release. So until you press the shutter release, it's not going to take a picture. Is that okay? The shutter release is what controls the timing. So you know, when you take a picture, not a video, okay? When you take a picture, you want to control the timing, and so the timing of when you click the shutter release is important. That's the job of the clock. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So let's check. The parking brake is released, okay, that's all good. Uh, but the camera is off right now because the EM pin is a zero, so let's turn on the camera. But the shutter release is not, it's not, we're not clicking yet because we are looking for a transition from zero to one. It is just currently a level zero. Is that okay? So this is the moment, okay? You know, when with all of these other conditions satisfied, and we have a zero to one transition at the clock, then it should remember. Wait, why is it not doing it? Oh, okay, I got it opposite. This is the EN and this is the clock. Okay, never mind. Okay, now <laughs> the clock is going from zero to one at this point, and the register changes from zero, zero to zero, one. If you look at the output of the register, Nothing surprising, it is just one. When you look at the output of the adder, it's already two. But we are not updating the register because not all requirements have been met in order for it to update. The parking brake is off, not a problem. It is enabled, but the trigger is not pressed. In other words, we have to reset the clock from zero, one back to zero, and then from one back to zero, oops, Keep clicking the wrong pin <clears throat> here back to zero and then back from zero to one then it updates the register again is that okay all right so we are going to build a you know the, the, the processor circuit you know needs you know this transition of the clock there's all, also just one clock for the entire processor okay because all of the devices inside the processor they need time synchronization and that's why we have a clock circuit, because we need to make sure by the time this register you know, takes the input in, the data is presented already. And that's why the timing part is super important. So in order for this circuit to be any, you know, any, you know, to demonstrate what it does, you kind of have to do this all day long, okay? Which is troublesome. So one thing you can also do in this circuit is instead of using an input pin for the clock, get rid of it, you can use what we call a clock pin. This is what we call the clock pin. So a clock pin looks like an input pin, except instead of zero and one, it has this kind of waveform pattern. When the waveform pattern is dark green, it is zero. When the uh, waveform pattern is light green, it is a one. Then you go like, uh, so how is that gonna be helpful, right? Because you know I can go to the poking tool, and change the clock manually like this. So that's about the same as a regular input pin, not very exciting. Well, the reason why this is useful or exciting is because we can go to simulate, and then you can go to tick frequency, and we're gonna pick something that's visible, okay? So we're gonna uh, have transition at eight times per second, and nothing happens because I have not clicked on tick enabled, or ticks enabled, so once it is enabled, you can see how the clock pin can alternate its state, in this case, eight times per second without any human intervention. 
So that's why the clock pin is really useful because when we actually build a, uh, build a processor in larger SIM, you don't want to be the person clicking the clock pin you know, on and off all the time because it will take like at least four transitions for one instruction to execute. So you're gonna have to click it like thousands of times, if not more, in order for a program to run to its completion. So this is the way to do it. So do we have any questions about you know, what we have talked about so far today? Because what the purpose of today's lecture is to introduce the concept of two things. One is a register. So the whole concept of an SR latch, the level sensitive B flip flop, the edge sensitive B flip flop, the edge sensitive and level sensitive B flip flop, the concept of a resettable edge and level sensitive B flip flop, those are all just tiny little steps so that we can understand what a register is. But then the register is only a major component in this case in what we call a clocked circuit. A clocked circuit means timing is important, okay? We have a mechanism here, which is the clock pin, controlling the timing of when a register should update. Are we doing okay so far with those concepts? And particularly how everything connects. Now, what about the, the table for us to trace you know, all the changes you know, within a circuit? Well, that's just so that we can convince ourselves that we understand how each of the more elemental circuits work. To me, that is important, okay? You know, I don't want to just look at the circuit and go like, okay, since this is how it's described, it's working, we'll just take it, okay? I want to be able to verify, you know, how it works. And the, that's the whole discussion of the trace table thing, you know, the spreadsheet. That's for tracking down what is inside an SR latch or D flip flop just so that we, are, we can convince ourselves of how a circuit works. All right, so at this point, I'll give you a very quick preview of what we'll be talking about in the next few weeks. So I'm gonna go to the processor. I don't have that here. So I'm gonna open the processor circuit and it's in my Documents folder, CISP 310, processor, processor 004. So open in there. This is the processor. And this is only a portion of it because you know, okay, let me let me zoom out so you can see the entire thing. Click, 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 one more time. Click, one more time. There you go. That is your processor. Okay. And the okay, so where are the registers? Okay, where are the registers? There are four registers in this thing here, and then there's an individual register here, there's another one over here, there's another one over here, there's another one over here, and then there are four within here. So the register bank has four registers on its own. All right. <laughs> so this is what we're gonna be using in about two weeks or so. Okay, you'll be writing programs in assembly language that will run on this processor. Okay. But the nice thing about this is we'll talk about all of the other devices in this processor. They are fairly easy devices to understand you know, because a switch, um, excuse me, a multiplexer versus a demultiplexer, those are like railroad switches, okay? The only difference is one input versus multiple output and you can select which output connects to the input, that's one. And then the other one is just a flip side, one output multiple inputs, which input connects to the only output, it's also a switch, okay? So multiplexers and demultiplexers are just railroad switches. And then the other devices is RAM, this is the RAM component, and this is the ROM component. So we'll talk about those components next week after the exam, so that gradually we'll understand every component used in the processor, and then we'll talk about how the processor itself works as a whole, okay? So this part is most likely unique to the way I teach this class. If you are to take this class from almost every other college, I don't even care whether it's a two year or four year, 
they would just use the x86 processor and then you just dive right into assembly language programming, but not really understanding <laughs> why do we have certain limitations of why can't I you know, just get these two things, add them together and put it over here? Because we don't have a pathway to do it. In this class, we'll actually look into the pathways between the registers and the ALU. This is the ALU, which stands for the arithmetic and logic unit. That is the only component of the entire processor that can do addition, subtraction, and all the other cool stuff that you want it to do. Okay, so that's kind of where that class is heading, okay? Um, think of this, I'm not sure how many of you, you know, as a kid, you know, wanted to have one of those, you know, transparent engine blocks, where there's a tiny little crank, so you can just turn the crank, you can see, you know, how the crank shaft and all the valves and all the cylinders work. As a kid, I always wanted one of those things, my parents never understood why I wanted to you know, build a model of, a, of an engine like that. Because you know, with those, you can actually turn the crankshaft and with a very tiny little touch, you can see how, oh, this cylinder is moving up, that cylinder is moving down, the valve is opening here, that valve is closing. So you can kind of imagine, okay, the fuel air mixture is coming in here, this one is just compressing, that one has a combustion, and this one you know, is just trying to get rid of the exhaust gas, right? That's a four cylinder four cycle cylinder uh, engine, you know, how the way it works. Because as a kid, I always wanted to see, okay, but how does it work? Okay, in theory, I kind of understand the concept, but I want to see it. This is basically the equivalent for modern day processors. Now, is, is someone going to take this design and put it onto silicon and make a chip out of it? No, this is awfully inefficient, you know, from the perspective of it doesn't have pipelining, it doesn't have any cash, blah, blah, blah. It's not practical, for, but from the perspective of understanding how things work inside a processor, I think it is helpful because it's simple enough that you can track down everything in the processor. Is that okay? Just one more thing, you know, I know it is not related to assembly language programming, it's more, like, more of a philosophy nature. Is, re in, is reinventing the wheel a good thing or bad? I mean, the wheel has been around for what, 10,000 years easily, okay? You know, it predates your writing, okay? Hmm? So it is a positive, it depends on how you look at it, okay? If you look at the process of reinventing the wheel, which means, oh, I have to haul all this stuff, you know, from here to there, and I got a stick on the ground, and I got something that is circular with a hole in between, okay? so. The process of problem solving and go like, oh, okay, if I you know, put the stick through that hole and then put you know, that, those sticks you know, on some platform and just roll things, you know, it, it reduces my effort, okay? The process of problem solving is good, okay? Even though the end product is something that we have known all along already. So that's kind of, this is me reinventing the wheel because I want to focus on the process. Okay, you know, how things work. Because you need to know that kind of knowledge if you want to become a computer engineer working on the next generation of AI chip, okay? Because there are a lot of startups now who want to get a piece of the action. Okay, what piece of action am I talking about? Who, who is getting all the action right now in terms of you know, manufacturing and selling AI chips? NVIDIA, and what is the worth of the company? Three trillion dollars, okay? You guys go like, three trillion dollars, three, you know, three billion dollars, what is the difference, right? Yeah, three, three, three trillion dollars is a lot of money. I'll put it this way. The United States has the largest army of the entire world. We have 11 carrier fleets, okay? And that's a lot of hardware, a lot of people, and so on. If NVIDIA is to purchase these you know, fleets and hire people, they can afford to have 40 something, close to 50 fleets. Four times <laughs> the, the Navy power of the entire United States. That's what $3 trillion can do. 
COVID is what a million billion or something like that? No, it's a thousand, thousand billion. billion. It's one thousand billion. So you guys might think, you know, but what about the people who work on those carriers and other ships? You know, all the people together in one single fleet is less than a billion dollar a year, which to NVIDIA is chump change. <laughs> that is how, that, that's the scale of what $3 trillion is, okay? The most important thing, okay, you know, I, I, you know, I, I talk about these things, you know, because you know, it doesn't seem like it is important, but it really is important, is how quickly companies get to the trillion mark. So we can look up, you know, how quickly tech companies grow in value. And I'll just kind of throw in NVIDIA, IBM, Microsoft, because those are the big names that we recognize. Um, and we're going to take a look at pictures, graphs, if possible. I think this one does show the what I need to show. So we'll take a look. And that's Jensen Huang. But I'm focusing on the picture right here. All right, so it doesn't have IBM, but it does have Apple and Microsoft, which all we all recognize. So you can see how Apple you know, took a long time to get to the trillion mark, you know, which is the three trillion mark here. Uh, Microsoft took a long time too. NVIDIA was kind of hovering over here, and then suddenly it just choked up. If you look at the time scale, okay, if you extend the time scale, instead of from 2023 and you extend it all the way back to, let's say 2000, you will see the sharp contrast of how you know, Apple and Microsoft they increased very, very gradually compared to NVIDIA. NVIDIA did not even take off until 2022 because that's when ChatGPT released version 3.5. And then right after that, poof, just like that. Okay? So I'm, I'm talking about this because I want you guys to consider career options, okay? Because many of you are going like, I want to do computer science. But computer engineering may also be a viable option, especially right now. Okay, now whether this is still going to be the case by the time you graduate, nobody can tell. For all we know, the whole thing can come crashing down in a few months, in a few years, in a decade. I cannot predict. Yeah, question? Yeah. I would say yes, you know, but it's going to take, you know, so the education path is a little, bit a little bit different. So computer engineers need to take more classes in logic design, which I cover a little bit in this class, okay? So I don't cover everything that has to do with you know, digital logic design. I cover a little bit, you know, you know the, the things that connect to a processor, I try to talk about it a little bit. So you will take expert classes in the computer engineering program that will not be in a computer science program. The computer science program, on the other hand, will probably offer more classes in terms of neural network, other types of machine learning, you know, paradigm and algorithms and whatnot, um, as well as you know, database, you know, networking, and all the other stuff in computer science. Computer engineering will focus more on you know, the design of the digital component of a computer. So they don't go all the way down to like RF technology, Wi-Fi, or anything like that, or Bluetooth. They only go you know, after things become digital, then they cover everything from that, all the way up to the programming part of the devices. All right, so, okay, so I know this is kind of like a digression, but I think it is an important digression in the context of this class. All right, so we do have a lab today. The lab today is basically doing the same thing that you have done already, which is the, uh, the, the tracking the proposition of propagation, sorry, propagation of the changes you know, in a circuit. So I'm going to unlock this one, and I'm gonna unlock this one too and change the date because I forgot to do it. So in order to do this, you're gonna have to make a copy of a spreadsheet that I have prepared already and then use that to log your answers. And what you need to turn in is a link to your Google Sheets, okay? So you turn in a link to your Google Sheets and make sure that you share that with me or make it visible to everybody. 
So I'm going to change the date. <coughs> give me a second. I, I'll give you guys the access code too. Uh, Trump saves. You know what? I've got to give you guys until next Tuesday to do this because it's going to take a while. So next Tuesday is five days from now. I cannot. I cannot remember how many days are in September. I'll make it due on the 1st of October. Okay. So October 1st, which is also the date when we have our exam one. And I'll make it due right before. So it's going to be 1030, no, 9 a.m. October 1st, 9 a.m. Why am I using the other keyboard when I have this one? Okay, there we go. <clears throat> All right. So I have to unhide the other one. It probably has a access code. I'm changing the due date of this one too. So let me give you the access code. Does it have an access code? Okay. Let me go to settings. Step master. <laughs> okay, that's your access code. And I'm going to change the, the due date. So even though the due date is not until next Tuesday. You, I recommend everybody to stay here at least to try to get the quiz done, okay, or at least get a part of it done. So let me change the due date of the the quiz part as well, because the there's a certain complexity to the questions in this quiz. So you know, staying here a little bit longer may be helpful. Oops, October first. 9 a.m. There we go. All right. So I have just updated you know, the due date and also for both of the activities. Um, so I'm going to, I will go get some water to drink and then I'll be back here in a few minutes. As much I do not recommend, if anyone wants to kind of like I can do this when I'm home, you know, you can, you can do so.
about coincidence. The text from my daughter was about, you know, choosing between computer engineering and electrical engineering. <laughs> so electrical engineering includes, you know, RF, you know, all the analog circuits, you know, device physics, and a lot of stuff like that. It takes longer, too. Mm -hmm.